And now to take us on to a, another level, we're delighted that we have Harriet Lamb, who is CEO of Fairtrade International. <laughs> And she is going to tell us about how fair trade on an international level is helping to deal with sustainability and international development issues. Welcome, Harriet. Good morning, everybody. Abraham Lincoln said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. Nonetheless, what a joy to be here and to speak at what is my favourite conference of the year. How fantastic to be with all of you, who are the people who have put fair trade on our shop shelves around the world and on the agendas of local governments right up to national and international governments. And it is amazing that there are now 1,647 fair trade towns in 27 countries. How fantastic is that? And how fantastic that that movement also just keeps on growing. And it's great to be here in Bristol as Green Capital of Europe 2015 putting the spotlight on the imperative, the urgent imperative, to find new and more inclusive ways to run the economy that are fair to people and to the planet. And there couldn't be a more important time for us to be all coming together to think about these issues. Next week is the warm-up act in New York of discussions around the Sustainable Development Goals, which are going to be agreed in the autumn. They're the big global goals that will be replacing the Millennium Development Goals, and which we can see a real shift from just the Millennium Development Goals focused very much on key targets around tackling poverty in developing countries. The Sustainable Development Goals take that ambition to another level. They really are about global goals for us, whether here in Bristol or in Nicaragua. And that they do focus both on people and on the environment. And that they talk very strongly about the need for inclusive growth, about making sure that no one is left behind. And you can really feel this growing tide of public anger about the current financial system and how it has left people. Uh, and the call, the growing call for new ways that we need to intervene in the economy. Some of you may have seen the fantastic statement by the Pope just recently, for example, when he came out very strongly saying, the environment is one of those goods that cannot be adequately safeguarded or promoted by market forces. That we have to intervene if we're going to protect the environment. Because if anything, the market is trashing the environment because it doesn't value the environment or many of the people that generate the profits. They are the externalities, which is why we have such a mess. And I think with real congratulations to people like Oxfam with their fantastic campaign, highlighting the terrible fact that by 2016, 1% of the world's population will have as much wealth as the other 99%. It is just unthinkable. And it is unsustainable. And that's why it is so important that we take this opportunity to really put the pressure on our governments to come up with bold and ambitious sustainable development goals and really take the action to put them into practice. And we also, of course, have the run-up to the big climate change meeting in December. And at both of those conferences, fair trade will be there. In fact, our statement next week has been translated into six languages. It's being read out to the delegates and we're hoping to push forward the point of view of the importance of listening to the smallholder farmers, whether discussing climate change or whether discussing those sustainable development goals. 
And Jenny was mentioning about prizes and the many prizes, and I'm sure many of you have fair trade prizes for campaigners in your countries and what you've achieved and the prizes for businesses. And inspired by that, we started some prizes just last year for the producers to say, well, who are the best producers? Who've done the most interesting and innovative things? And one of the winners was Harvest Flower Farm, about two dusty hours outside Nairobi. <coughs> Uh, and because they'd won, I was lucky enough to go to visit them uh, just a few months ago. And it was really inspiring. And one of the prizes that uh, this flower farm, the workers' committee on the flower farm, well, the prize was an iPad. Uh, and they've used the iPad. Firstly, they've used it to tweet. They are the world's most busy tweeters. <laughs> so can I recommend Harvest Flowers? Uh, add them to your tweet list and be inspired by uh, the incredible work they're doing and they wanted to tweet because they said, we want to join this amazing campaign that talks about fair trade. And they've also used their iPad to do the research. And they looked up the sustainable development goals and what's happening. And they looked up what's happening at the climate change talks. And so Samuel Otieno, the chairman, explained to me that when he's deciding, uh, their, their committee comes together and they think, well, how to spend the premium? And they listen to the workers, and they do their research, and they listen to the needs of the workers. And then they looked at the global sustainable development goals, and then they looked at Kenya's national goals to 2030. And he said, the environment is a key pillar of our work. We want to address injustices such as climate change. If I move as an African, as a Kenyan, as a worker, then we can have more impact. The Sustainable Development Goals are about us as workers. And so they took those goals and they've linked them up with the needs in their community. And so, for example, they looked at the goals about gender inequality and enabling more girls to stay in school. They listened to what the workers were saying and they discovered one reason girls don't day in school is because when they get their periods they feel too shy and so they have a scheme where they give out sanitary towels and as a result of that there's been a 40 to 60 percent increase in girls staying on at school and they're monitoring and they're tracking everything they're doing and in the same way they looked at the goals around tackling climate change and they've had a massive program of tree planting and I should say, it's one of the very inspiring things that people uh, do in many communities around the world, is when you go and visit, you plant a tree. And I thought maybe at one of the International Fair Trade Towns conferences, we could together plant some trees as our contribution together as a movement towards climate change. <laughs> is that getting back in? <laughs> And so in the same way, we need to make sure that what we're doing as fair trade towns, as a global fair trade movement, is listening to the needs of the farmers and of the citizens and connecting that with the big global changes that we want to make. And I'm so, I must give so much credit to uh, fair trade movement here in Bristol, uh, both to the fantastic support of the City Council and to the outstanding work of Jenny. Uh, and in particular, fantastic moment to have highlighted the environment. Because too often that is something that fair trade has kept hidden under a bush. We haven't talked enough about the impact that fair trade is having on the environment. And indeed, for many of the farmers, it's very natural. They absolutely see it as two sides of the same coin, being fair to the people and being fair to the planet. And many communities, of course, don't have that same divide that we've put up in our minds between the environment, which is somehow over there, and the rest of our lives. But of course, many communities, they're living in, they're working in the environment, and it's absolutely integral, often also, to their cultures. And as I mentioned in the film, over half of all the fair trade producers are actually organic certified. And indeed, many have used the fair trade premium to go that final step of getting organic certification. And this is just one example. It's a big cooperative in South India, in Kerala, uh, where the beautifully named Sunny 
Sonny Babu is the plant doctor uh, employed by the cooperative. He gets up at four o'clock every morning with the birds because he says that's the time to really see what's happening in nature in the plants. And he goes around training the farmers on understanding what's happening with their plants. And uh, he has, for example, spotting the problems and finding ways to deal with them that are organic. And so, for example, on a nutmeg tree, uh, because these are very beautifully diverse farms with many, many, many different, different plants growing there. And on the nutmeg tree, he spotted the problem and immediately worked out that the solution was to use neem oil, which is a very traditional tree in India, together with garlic to tackle the problem in a natural way. Or to give another example, Springfield is a lychee farm in South Africa where surrounded by environmental degradation, they have made it their ambition to really care for the environment. They cleaned up over a ton of rubbish and then they've worked really hard to say that animals are not seen as pests on our farm, they're seen as farm residents. And they're proud to have 120 bird species, as well as a rock python and leopards and crocodiles and hippos as their farm residents. But of course, we also have fair trade standards about the environment, because not all producers are organic, and not all producers have got that deep in their way of working. And so the WFTO standards absolutely have a key pillar around respect for the environment. And fair trade too has standards going through in detail how the farmers have to not use the bad chemicals, have to protect the waterways, protect biodiversity, prevent soil erosion, avoid GMOs. Uh, a list of lists, actually 12 pages if you're really having trouble sleeping at night on our website where you can see the very tough standards that farmers have to go through and have to adhere to and keep to to be fair trade certified, but always building on the premise that it's about strong, empowered producer groups. It's only with strong groups that they can themselves create the plan that works for their environment and meet the standards where they are in the best way. And indeed, research is showing the impact that that's having. Here's just one example of some research looking at Brazilian orange juice farmers, where they mentioned that fair trade certification process has been an incentive for real change in environmental practices. That the co-op created a system to make sure they're really meeting the standard, that all the smallholders are meeting the environmental standard. And people involved confirmed that the farmers had a much greater awareness of environmental practices and were setting a positive example to their neighbours. And then, of course, the farmers often are not just meeting the standards and working to improve, but they're also often investing the fair trade premium in uh, promoting the environment and increasing their best practice. And here's one example from a tea smallholder in Malawi explained how they're using the fair trade premium to source seeds of indigenous and exotic trees that they want to plant to improve the soil and protect more rain. And it's one of a number of groups that are using the premium to protect indigenous species that are at risk. And indeed, last year, over a million uh, euros of the premium was invested in protecting the environment in a range of different ways, from the walnut growers in Chile who put up solar panels through to the group in Indonesia that was formed, coffee growers in Indonesia formed after the tsunami. They came together as a cooperative then. And one of the things they realized was the tsunami was, was partly perhaps caused by some of the huge big shifts in the climate. And they therefore really have a dedicated focus on the environment and they use some of their premium to support a local group protecting the Sumatran white tiger that is very much at risk. So there's a hundred ways in which the farmers are tackling the environmental pressures which they face in their communities. But fair trade, we often say, and obviously fair trade's uh, all about going shopping. So um, I have here in my shopping bag, actually, um, unfortunately it's not fair trade, but I'm sure it's a local Bristol onion. Um, and uh, fair trade onion, maybe that's where we should get next. And um, 
We always think fair trade's a bit like unpeeling an onion. You're always finding the new levels, the new layers of complexity, the next stage to which we go. And so then we find that so much of the progress that's been made by the producers over the past 25 years in tackling the environment is absolutely put at threat now by climate change. That it is actually looming over everything that the producers are doing. And we're very proud in fair trade to be the only market that is half owned by the producers of Africa, Asia and Latin America. And they've absolutely been the ones who've put climate change on our agenda. They were the ones who said we've absolutely got to do more about it because this has completely become the dominant factor in our lives. I was recently, for example, in Guatemala in an area of the Mayan biosphere where the producers say they've got a 40% drop in, in their coffee harvest. 40% drop in their coffee harvest. And you can see here a farmer, he's got no leaves, it, the, the leaves have fallen off, it's gone black, and you can imagine what that means for their livelihoods. And the bees, he said, are not producing honey anymore because uh, the weather is simply too cold. And in some places it's too cold, and in some it's too hot. It's raining when it should be sunny, and it's sunny when it should be raining. We was, here's a tea farmer uh, in Kenya. They were hit by a hailstorm out of nowhere and frosts that destroyed all their tea. There is example after example of how this is hitting the producers. And as um, from also from Nicaragua, as Bayardo said, there's a chain on earth that starts at the bottom where the producers are. They're the ones who suffer the consequences of climate change, who get the least help and who carry all of the burden. It's not fair. They are also, of course, the people who have done the least to contribute to it. And that's why we've launched ambitious programs to see how can we help, first of all, producers adapt. And here's an example of working with young people, the next generation of coffee farmers, learning new techniques to adapt to the changing climate. And this is great work done in Peru, particularly by Twin Trading, the group behind Cafe Direct and Divine Chocolate Liberation Nuts. And here you can see the young people now learning new techniques of planting. And again here, training the trainers, making sure that the farmers themselves know more about it so that they can go out and talk to others. We're also launching an exciting new scheme of fair trade carbon credits. So that instead of companies offsetting and buying on a global market credits that build water dams in China, they can instead inset by actually investing back in the producers from whom they buy. And so we're setting a minimum price for carbon credits and seeing how this can be a way for producers to gain more income. But all of these initiatives, important as they are, are not as important as getting the big changes we need out of the global governance. And that's why we will undoubtedly be stepping up in coming years our advocacy work, seeking more and more to really put our messages forward to governments at a, nas at a city level, at a national level, at an European and a global level. And that's where you, as the grassroots social movement, can be more important than ever in making sure that the voice of ordinary people are heard in those big talks around climate change and around the sustainable development goals. And I'd really like to pay credit to those fantastic people like Linda McAvan, MEP, who's speaking later, who have from the beginning been pushing the importance of fair trade and the importance of action on some of these big goals. It was uh, the Filipino speaker, who some of you may have heard at the climate change talks, who summed it all up, uh, when his frustration at the inability to move world governments on climate change in 2012, his own country devastated by storms, when he said, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? And so let us together as a fair trade TANS movement here in Bristol for the day commit to really redouble our efforts on really promoting fair trade and all that it does for the environment, but also in getting those big 
global changes that we need from governments. And in that role of really pushing governments, that's where you have played such a fantastic role all along in pushing fair trade to their attention. And um, going back to the old-fashioned ways, who do we have here from Sweden? Do we have many people here from Sweden? Well, the grassroots social movement in Sweden has done the most outstanding job in raising awareness. Sales of fair trade in Sweden are booming and they've put it on the agenda of their new government. And I have here to share with you to end a message from the Vice Minister for Finance in Sweden. He's also uh, the Minister for Consumer Affairs and he sends here a message, I hope, that he sent to our General Assembly, uh, okay, I might need some help, that he sent to our General Assembly just two weeks ago, uh, and which he was very keen that could also be shared with all of you from the Fair Trade Towns Conference. And I must say huge congratulations to all of you in Sweden. You're obviously doing an outstanding job in making sure that they can't ignore what's going on. Dear Fairtrade friends and delegates from all around the world, my name is Per Bullen and I'm the Minister of Consumer Affairs from Sweden. I think it's important that everyone on this planet should have decent working conditions and living conditions in the future. And for that reason, I'm very happy that the Swedish consumers have shown a strong commitment to fair trade. And the increase in fair trade marked products was 40% on the Swedish markets last year. I also see a strong commitment from cities in Sweden and about one third of the Swedish cities are now fair trade cities. But fair trade should not be a responsibility only for consumers and for cities, but governments should also be involved. And for that reason, Sweden has taken the commitment to become the first country with its own sovereignty to be a fair trade nation. This autumn, I'm inviting business and civil society to take part in a platform meeting to perform the criteria that Sweden should fill to be a fair trade nation, and also to share the responsibility for raising the fair trade issues. But I also want this to be taking part on the global arena, and I'm leading the Swedish delegation to the United Nations Conference on Finance for Development this summer. And there I hope that the Swedish commitment will also provide a platform for sharing and for more governments to follow, more nations to take part in this movement. I think it's very important that we get a good result from the Financing for Development uh, Conference in order to get a good result when it comes to the sustainable development goals that will be uh, decided in New York this autumn. So I hope that you have a successful meeting and I wish you all the luck with your important work and with uh, performing a strategy for 2016 until 2020. And I hope that we can work together to get good working and good living conditions for everyone on this planet in the future. Thank you very much.